there's nothing that, that could or still can compare with St. Louis. The most amazing thing about the life casting, Mrs. Bush is holding up the president. Ordinary Americans rose to the occasion, and they're the ones who got us to the moon. Today on Spotlight, a St. Louisan with a special interest in the Mars rover. Plus, hear stories of the people who get the astronauts to the moon. Also, we miss the Muni, so we're taking you behind the scenes. First up, a heartfelt performance at America's oldest and largest outdoor theater from the Arts United STL event. It's Sunday and you're watching Spotlight. For 102 years, the people of St. Louis have come together here in Forest Park to sit beneath the stars and to relish magical summer nights of unforgettable entertainment here at the Muni. Generations of our own artists and artisans have, along with some of the most famous people in the world, helped to create what we call Muni magic. Dancers, singers, painters, designers, carpenters, and sewers, all right here. The Muni is the soul of St. Louis, a place where a young kid like myself could sit in a free seat and dream of the day that he could be on that magnificent stage. So, in support of all the artists in St. Louis, past and present, we offer you our song. Kiss today, goodbye. The sweetness and the sorrow. Wish me luck the same to you. But I can't regret what I did for love, what I did for love. Look, my eyes are dry. The gift was ours to borrow. It's as if we always knew. And I won't forget. What I did for love, what I did for love. Today, goodbye, and point me toward tomorrow. We did what we had to do. Won't forget, can't regret what I did for love. What I did for. on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
The transformational otherworldliness of attending a production of the Muni comes not only from the soaring musical numbers and the vast open-air sets, but also in large part to the elaborate costumes. And for more than half of the Muni's history, one man was responsible for overseeing all those costumes, Pete Massinio. I started here at age 20, that which was 1949. I was here 63 years and a long, long hours, seven days a week. Let's say that we had a show on the, on the, on the, on the uh, boards, a show that was playing, but we would be working on the morning portion of that. We would have costume uh, seamstresses coming in to do the repairs from the night before. That would be a certain section, but then you'd have another section of seamstresses, or, so, or stitchers as they call them today, working on the show that's going to be opened in dress rehearsal on Saturday night. Pete learned how to stitch working in his father's shoe repair shop in downtown St. Louis. I started at age nine doing all hand sewing on leather. And from there I drifted into sewing. Before moving backstage, first as a stage manager, then later as head of wardrobe, Pete was a singer in the ensemble for six years, performing in 11 shows per season. When they, when they selected you then, you did the entire summer. This was considered summer theater, summer stock. And you would have like a, what you would come, they would bring in the leads. The leads would come in, but you would have stock people here. You have a stock singing baritone, you have a stock soprano, a stock contralto, a stock character actor. And they would do a, sh a role every week. But it was the wardrobe department, coordinating and overseeing an average of 350 costumes per show, from hats to shoes and everything in between, where Pete was truly in his element with his Muni family. You went into wardrobe and that was your home. If you had no place to go, come on in and have a cup of coffee with us. The actors knew that they could, could come to our department and be, feel good or cool off, you know. Maybe that was half the time why they came in. <laughs> and although he spent several winters in New York and had opportunities to go to other theaters, every summer he came back to the Muni. I came back because my family was here and because it was the best theater in, in the United States to work summer theater. There's nothing that, that could or still can compare with St. Louis. It's the greatest. It's the oldest and largest outdoor theater in the country. The Muni has been making magic for 100 years. The seats go, seem to go on for miles. When that audience claps and it's a full house, there's nothing like it. The Muni is totally unique. No one does seven shows in eight weeks. That's an insane schedule. Every element is created here. The costumes, the scenery, the makeup, the props. Mammoth Productions, 11 days of rehearsal, St. Louis, outdoor, summer theater. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any logical sense. But that is precisely when and where it happens. Big, giant, magical beast of incredible Muni magic. Dozens of interviews tell the story of the Muni's incredible milestone. It's ours, it's St. Louis's, it's a part of our life. It absolutely represents the best of us. The best of us. 100 Seasons of Muni Magic. The Mars 2020 mission is on Ray Arvidson's mind during the countdown to the launch of the Perseverance rover. Arvidson is waiting quietly on the sidelines this time which is rare for such a mission. The professor at Washington University in St. Louis played a significant role in several rover and lander launches to landings and beyond. Because for the first 90 days of the mission, you're out at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory living on Mars time. And I've done enough of that. I think I'm the individual who's done more Mars time than anyone else on the Earth because I've, I've been doing this so long. Viking Lander 1, Viking Lander 2, Phoenix, Spirit Opportunity Curiosity times 90 days 
living on a, a day that's some number of minutes longer than an Earth day, and you go in every every shift a little bit later, you know, to keep up with the Mars clock. I pretty much had it. That is, for the day-to-day boots-on-the-ground science. Arvidsson did quite a few things to get the Mars 2020 mission launched. His motivation, origins of life research. Perseverance will continue the success of other Mars rovers, conducting a detailed search for evidence of ancient life on Mars. Although he's not on the science team, Arvidsson and his lab have been involved and instrumental. We're providing products they can use to help them design where they're going to rove to to get samples. He also helped with wheel design from his experience with rovers. He's a NASA science team member for the Curiosity rover in charge of path planning. Using NASA's mixed reality software called OnSite with Microsoft HoloLens, the tools and sophisticated imaging help Arvidsson visualize Curiosity's drive. Real scale. So I can walk up and down the hallway and actually walk the site with the engineers who are planning the drive and say, hey guys, avoid this rock. This is a, a low area that's filled with sand. It's too deep for the, the wheels to get through. Because of the time he spends with Curiosity, Arvidsson took a step back from Perseverance. I can't do two rovers again. Because that's just too much work. He's referring to handling operations for the Opportunity rover and Curiosity at the same time. It's only been a couple years since NASA last heard from Opportunity after an enormous Martian dust storm. Arvidsson is the deputy principal investigator for the Mars Exploration Rover mission in charge of Opportunity. Over time, Arvidsson and the rovers experience many milestones, finding evidence that Mars once had fresh water and signs of microbial life. Curiosity's kind of mantra was, was the planet habitable? And the answer is yes, right? Because when we drilled into the lake beds, we found evidence for water-bearing minerals and organic materials. Now Perseverance is sent to accomplish even more. Arvidsson was part of the team creating specifications for the Mars 2020 mission. He helped choose the landing site. Which is Jezero Crater with this big eroded delta. And we're continuing to provide images and other pieces of information that help the science team once they land and start traversing where to go to get the best samples. He helped the team succeed with one of the mission's biggest proposals, the ability for Perseverance to drill and collect rock and soil samples for possible return to Earth. A future rover, what he calls a fetching rover, would go to Mars to retrieve and return samples. Why is it so important? because you can do many, many, many more very detailed analyses in the laboratory than you can do from a rover. And also the laboratory, the instruments get better and better and better. to look at smaller and smaller pieces and various pieces of information. So that's really a mission that will keep on giving for, for you know, a century. Perseverance has the latest advancements and will test new technology for future robotic and human exploration. And the Mars helicopter Ingenuity is hitching a ride to test the first powered flight on Mars. Arvidsson's campus facility is already home to NASA's planetary data system Geosciences node. His lab will be archiving all the Perseverance data. Images, chemistry, mineralogy, organic content posted through our websites. How are you feeling as we get closer to the launch date? Anxiety is more like it, right? Because travel in space is not uh, easy. The hardest part is landing. Scheduled in February 2021. A local sculptor remembers George H.W. Bush later on Spotlight. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. July 1969, 70% of today's Americans were not even born or were too young to remember this historic event. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And yet, most of us know those famous words and recognize these famous names. But there's a lot more about the Apollo missions author Charles Fishman bets you probably don't know. We always tell the moon story from the perspective of the astronauts, and, and, and that's totally understandable. But I wanted to tell the story of going to the moon from the perspective of the people back on Earth who had to do the work. 
because that's not a well-told story. Ordinary Americans rose to the occasion in this remarkable way, and they're the ones who got us to the moon. 410,000 ordinary Americans worked on the Apollo missions, and plenty of them had stories just waiting for this former Washington Post space reporter to tell. He's one of these great figures that is not actually well known in American history and should be. There's not a single book written about him. Fishman talks about that quirky Missourian, plus several other men and women working in this time of innovation on demand, brought on by this famous 1961 speech. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Hard was an understatement. We didn't have a rocket strong enough, a computer powerful enough, or spacesuits sturdy enough to send people to the moon. It all had to be dreamed up by Americans quickly. That is what is so impressive. A lot of work back on Earth was done by hand. That's what's fun because it's people that we all can kind of relate to, right? Because exactly. Ordinary Americans sort of rose to the occasion in this remarkable way, and, and they're the ones who got us to the moon, right? The, the astronauts flew the spaceships, but they didn't build the spaceships. They didn't design the spaceships. They didn't imagine the spaceships. LOL, the, not laugh out loud, the, the little the, old lady. The little old lady. So, the most amazing example of this sort of high-tech equipment that was made by hand is, in fact, the computer. Those computers were the smallest, fastest, most advanced computers that had ever been created at that moment. But we didn't actually have the technology to manufacture the circuitry. And so the wiring of the computers, the programming, was woven by hand, as you say, by by women who got the nickname Little Old Ladies, the LOL Ladies, um, in a factory in Waltham, Massachusetts. They weren't old. <laughs> Most of them were clearly in their 30s or 40s if you look at the pictures and watch the videos. And they were literally former textile workers. Of all the stories that you found out through this research, was there one that you really loved or one that, that you really brought it home for you, how immense this mission was? I was chasing something to do with parachutes, and I don't even remember what question I was trying to answer. And I, and I found this incredible, you know, 50, 55-year-old story about the men and women who folded the Apollo parachutes. You have to be licensed by the FAA to fold those, and they, they actually, hmm. they, they, they re-examine you every six months to make sure you're doing it right and know what you're doing. There were only three people in the whole country who had been trained and then licensed to fold Apollo parachutes, two uh, men and a woman in uh, California. And they were so important to NASA and to Apollo that NASA forbid the three of them to ride in the same car together <laughs> because they didn't want them injured in the same, they couldn't afford to have them injured in the same accident. Well, that's just a wonderful story. So Mike Pence recently said that, that we're going back to the moon. We're in a space race again with, with China this time. This is, in fact, the most exciting moment, I think, in space since Apollo. And what's exciting is not, unfortunately, what NASA's doing. What's exciting is what's happening with private companies, what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX, what Jeff Bezos is doing with Blue Origin. As we speak, only about 550 people have been to space total during the entire space age. If you go back to the era of Apollo, we haven't even launched one person a month to space, about nine a year for the last 50 years. That's not the space age. That's not the Jetsons. That's not the, the USS Enterprise. But I think 50 years from now, we will look back at this moment, at this anniversary, and say, that was, that was the moment when things started to change again. Text FISHMAN to 31996 to hear more of his Apollo stories or download our Talking with Authors podcast. Go to hecmedia.org for the arts and authors. Completely accidental because I never set out to write a book. Culture and community. It's considered to be the oldest organic farm west of the Mississippi. Science. I'm wearing 3D glasses, operating on a high definition screen. And history. I was really blown away by the strategy that was used through the Underground Railroad. Education. I look forward to the day when they graduate high school. I want to be a part of that. Films. It's a long cost penny. Finding the coin places the site firmly in the 13th century. What's happening now around St. Louis and more.
this is powerful, seeing my mother's story being told. Search all of HEC Media's award-winning content. HEC Media has earned the Mid-America Emmy Award for Overall Excellence four times. See for yourself at hecmedia.org. The St. Louis Artist Guild is open with Clearly Human 4, and it seems like it has been forever. So we're very excited to have our doors open again and welcome visitors to the St. Louis Artist Guild. Clearly Human 4 is a biennial show. We started the exhibit eight years ago. Uh, honestly, we were just throwing around concepts, what would be an interesting show, and it's just like, let's have a figurative show. And as we thought about it more, then it just, you know, opened up all kinds of possibilities of how artists approach narrative and even abstract work involving the human figure or elements of being human. And there's always a great response from the artists, and it makes a great show of a wide variety of work. There's mixed media, collage, digital work, digital drawing, traditional oil painting, and academic studies of the figure. That's one thing I think I love about juried shows, though they may have a direct concept, they're always all media. And it's one of those shows that brings so many different concepts and approaches to figurative work. Clearly Human 4 was originally supposed to open on April 10th. The world was changing rapidly in March, and uh, by March 19th, we were closed. So not all work came, and not all work that was accepted is in this show because the artists could not afford to ship their work any longer. So this pandemic has been very hard on, on artists across the nation. So as it looked like, you know, the world was trying to open again, we picked uh, later in June, and that gave time for the artists to get their work here. And for us to make sure it truly was safe to open and to start out slowly. So we're delighted with the work that got here, the artists that were accepted and could not get their work here. We have them listed on our website with an image of their work because this is unusual circumstances and we wanted them to be included also. So it's been quite a process to even get to this point, but we're thrilled to be here and have the artists that could get their work here. If you're visiting the St. Louis Artist Guild in the Clearly Human show, we ask that you please wear a mask and we are asking people to sign in and give us a phone number or email just in case we would have to reach out to you. And we have a lot of space here, so right at the moment we could have 25 people here comfortably with social distancing. And so please, please come visit us. We can't wait to see you and we are just thrilled to have art in an exhibit again. Happening now through August 1st at the St. Louis Artist Guild. Visit stlouisartistguild.org for more information. Follow HEC Media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. America in mourning tonight after the death of former President George H.W. Bush. While most Americans only knew the nation's 41st president from afar, St. Louis sculptor Don Wiegand's experience with George H.W. Bush was truly hands-on. I had to set up this thing so it would work in one shot. Very nervous. Don Wiegand makes his living as a sculptor but he does a lot of work for free through the Wiegand Foundation, which creates works of art to honor people making the world a better place. And one of the ways he does that is through life castings, three-dimensional plaster copies of a person's hands made using a mold. And after Don had done one for President Bush's St. Louis cousin, Bert Walker, and his wife, Walker suggested to the former president and first lady that they have Don do one of them too. And in August of 2013, he did, bringing his casting tools to their home in Kennebunkport. It was an amazing experience to go into their home, and they were sitting in very overstuffed easy chairs. Very casually, the president was reading a letter and a book. He just basically said, Don, here's my hand, do what you want with it. Don suggested Mr. and Mrs. Bush hold each other's hands and then stick their arms into a bucket of molding compound and hold the pose for 10 minutes. Yeah, it was kind of frightening. <laughs> and I certainly didn't want to look at the surroundings because it would make me more nervous. I was just thinking of them as two people and I'm just doing a job. 
when they first put them in, I always tell them, I'll go have dinner and I'll come back in two days and I'll pull your hands out, but you know, I didn't do that. I, <laughs> I didn't catch him on that one. <laughs> this was not the first time Don Wiegand had met President Bush. In 1989, his first year in office, the family of Ernest Hemingway, together with the state of Idaho, presented Mr. Bush with a bust of Hemingway sculpted by Don Wiegand. And that was not the first time Don Wiegand was in the Oval Office, because a few years earlier, he presented a bust of Mark Twain to President Reagan. Wiegand says Reagan was nice, but more formal than Bush. It's almost scary walking into that room. You could feel the power coming out of the floor. President Bush uh, was very gracious, very down to earth. It's almost like I thought, I thought he'd want to sit down in the Oval Office and have a beer. They did not end up sharing a drink, but Mr. Bush gave Don something even better. But he gave us a present, and I opened up the case, and it was the presidential Bush cufflinks, which was very cool. I've worn them a number of times, only for special occasions. One of those special occasions was a USO ceremony in 2002. The group was awarding a special edition of the USO's Spirit of Hope Medal, which Don designed through the Wiegand Foundation. That year's recipient was George H.W. Bush. The artist and the president were together again. And I raised my arm up and said, I, you gave me these cufflinks in the Oval Office in 89. It's such an honor to wear them. And he was so cool because he said, Don, I liked him. I saved the set. He raised his arm and dropped the sleeve. Eleven years later, they met for a third time when Don came to Kenny Bunkport to do the live casting. He finished touching up the piece in two weeks, but getting back on the former president's schedule for the unveiling took two years. In August 2015, they met for the fourth and final time when Don returned to Kenny Bunkboard with Bert and Carol Walker to present the live casting to the Bushes. The most amazing thing about the live casting shows that Mrs. Bush is holding up the president. It wasn't planned, it's a pure moment of just reality. I pointed out to both of them how she was holding him up, and he really liked that. Barbara Bush suggested the piece go to the Presidential Library in College Station, Texas, where it remains today as part of the collection. It was a blessed experience. It was really amazing. Don Wiegand has had many rewarding experiences through his art, but his relationship with George H.W. Bush adds new meaning to the phrase, first-hand experience. It's almost like you're just, you're going for it and you pray that something's gonna work. And it did, and it was actually magical. Thanks for watching Spotlight. See all of these stories again at hecmedia.org. We'll be back next week with more on the arts, authors, and culture at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.